Hello everyone, and welcome to this session, where we'll be delving into the complexities of cardiomyopathies, an essential topic frequently tested in the USMLE Step 1 exam. Understanding these cases can significantly enhance your ability to tackle related questions on test day. Let's start by exploring a series of clinical scenarios that highlight different types of cardiomyopathies, each with its own unique presentation and implications. Let's consider a 34-year-old man who has been diagnosed with advanced non-Hodgkin lymphoma. He was treated with multiple cycles of doxorubicin-containing chemotherapy and initially responded well. However, several weeks after his last chemotherapy cycle, he begins to experience progressive exertional dyspnea and orthopnea, requiring him to sleep propped up with several pillows. On physical examination, his blood pressure is 124 over 72, his pulse is 86 per minute, and his oxygen saturation on room air is 96%. He is noted to have bilateral crackles on lung auscultation and mild bilateral pitting edema. Given this clinical picture, the most likely diagnosis is dilated cardiomyopathy secondary to anthracycline doxorubicin therapy, a known cause of cardiotoxicity. Doxorubicin exerts its anti-tumor effects by intercalating into DNA and generating free radicals. Unfortunately, these same mechanisms can cause myocardial damage, leading to dilated cardiomyopathy. This condition is characterized by ventricular dilation and systolic dysfunction, resulting in a decreased ejection fraction and heart failure symptoms. Recognizing anthracycline-induced cardiomyopathy is crucial for initiating appropriate management, which may include the use of ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, and potentially the discontinuation of the offending agent. Prophylactic use of dexrazoxane, a cardioprotective agent, is an important preventive strategy. This case underscores the importance of understanding drug-induced cardiomyopathies, a common topic in step one exam. Okay, next. Revisiting the case of the 34-year-old man treated for non-Hodgkin lymphoma, his presentation of exertional dyspnea, orthopnea, and pitting edema strongly suggests a diagnosis of dilated cardiomyopathy due to doxorubicin. The development of this condition post-chemotherapy highlights the cumulative dose-dependent cardiotoxicity associated with anthracyclines. The recognition of anthracycline-induced cardiomyopathy is crucial for initiating appropriate management, which may include the use of ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, and potentially the discontinuation of the offending agent. Prophylactic use of dexrazoxane, a cardioprotective agent, is an important preventive strategy. This case underscores the importance of understanding drug-induced cardiomyopathies, a common topic in the USMLE Step 1 exam. Familiarity with the clinical signs and preventive measures is essential for answering related questions. Next, imagine a 20-year-old college student who suddenly dies in his sleep. In the weeks leading up to his death, he complained of fatigue, palpitations, and dyspnea with exertion. His family history reveals that his mother had heart failure and underwent a heart transplant at age 40. Genetic testing reveals a truncating mutation in the TTN gene, which encodes the sarcomer protein titan. During autopsy, the findings are consistent with dilated cardiomyopathy, characterized by enlarged ventricular chambers with thin walls and reduced systolic function. The TTN gene mutation is a well-known cause of familial dilated cardiomyopathy, which follows an autosomal dominant inheritance pattern with incomplete penetrance. The TTN gene encodes titin, an essential sarcomere protein that contributes to myocardial elasticity and contractility. Mutations in this gene result in dilated cardiomyopathy, leading to an increased risk of heart failure and sudden cardiac death due to arrhythmias. For the USMLE, understanding the genetic basis of dilated cardiomyopathy, particularly the role of the TTN gene, is vital. This knowledge is often tested in questions that explore the relationship between genetics and clinical outcomes in cardiomyopathies. Moving on to a different type of cardiomyopathy, consider a 78-year-old man presenting with progressive fatigue, exertional dyspnea, and orthopnea. On examination, he has bibasilar crackles, elevated jugular venous pressure, and bilateral lower extremity pitting edema. His left ventricular diastolic pressure volume curve shows elevated pressures, indicative of reduced ventricular compliance. The most likely diagnosis is restrictive cardiomyopathy due to transthyretin amyloidosis. 
In this condition, amyloid proteins deposit within the myocardial tissue, leading to stiffened ventricular walls that impair diastolic filling. The increased diastolic pressures result in pulmonary congestion and systemic venous hypertension, manifesting as heart failure symptoms. Transthyretin amyloidosis, particularly common in the elderly, leads to restrictive cardiomyopathy by depositing insoluble amyloid proteins in the myocardium. This causes the ventricles to become non-compliant, resulting in diastolic heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Next, consider an 82-year-old man with a history of hypertension who presents with progressive dyspnea, fatigue, and bilateral lower extremity edema. His physical examination reveals elevated JVD with a rapid Y descent, a prominent S4 heart sound, and ascites. An echocardiogram shows left atrial enlargement and marked left ventricular hypertrophy with a normal ejection fraction. Endomyocardial biopsy reveals amyloid deposits consistent with senile amyloidosis. In senile amyloidosis, wild-type transtheretin accumulates in the myocardium, leading to restrictive cardiomyopathy. This condition primarily affects the elderly and is characterized by increased ventricular stiffness and impaired diastolic filling, manifesting as heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. The USMLE Step 1 often tests on the causes of restrictive cardiomyopathy, particularly distinguishing between senile amyloidosis and other infiltrative diseases. Finally, let's discuss a 61-year-old woman who presents with chest pressure and shortness of breath following the sudden death of her husband in a car accident. Her ECG shows T-wave inversions in the anterior leads, and echocardiography reveals hypokinesis of the apical segments with a reduced ejection fraction. Coronary angiography, however, shows no obstructive coronary artery disease. This presentation is classic for stress-induced or Takotsubo cardiomyopathy, often triggered by a surge of catecholamines in response to severe emotional stress. The characteristic ballooning of the left ventricle, seen on echocardiogram, mimics the shape of a Japanese octopus trap, hence the name Takotsubo. Takotsubo cardiomyopathy results from a catecholamine surge that leads to transient myocardial stunning, predominantly affecting the apical segments of the left ventricle. Although it mimics acute coronary syndrome, the absence of significant coronary artery disease on angiography differentiates it from a true myocardial infarction. The NBME frequently tests on the differential diagnosis of acute chest pain, emphasizing conditions like Takotsubo cardiomyopathy. Knowing how to differentiate this from ischemic heart disease is crucial for the exam. So in summary, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is characterized by asymmetric septal hypertrophy, leading to left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. This condition is often due to autosomal dominant mutations in sarcomere proteins, such as the beta-myosin heavy chain. Clinically, it's important to recognize the risk of sudden cardiac death, particularly in young athletes, as this is a high yield topic frequently tested by the NBME. Dilated cardiomyopathy, which involves ventricular dilation and systolic dysfunction. It can be caused by genetic mutations like those in the TTN gene, or by external factors such as alcohol, doxorubicin, or viral infections. Patients typically present with heart failure symptoms, and they are at risk for cardiac death due to arrhythmias. Restrictive cardiomyopathy is another important type, characterized by decreased ventricular compliance and preserved systolic function. This form is often associated with infiltrative diseases, such as amyloidosis, which lead to diastolic heart failure. Key clinical features include elevated filling pressures and a prominent S4 heart sound, which are crucial for recognizing this condition on exams. Finally, stress-induced or Takotsubo cardiomyopathy, also known as broken heart syndrome, involves transient left ventricular dysfunction, often triggered by a surge in catecholamines due to physical or emotional stress. This condition mimics a myocardial infarction, but typically shows normal coronary arteries on angiography and is reversible with supportive care. By keeping these key features in mind, you'll be well prepared to answer questions on cardiomyopathies in your step one exam. Thank you for joining this episode of the Metacaucus video series. 
Stay tuned for more high-yield discussions on topics that frequently appear in your NBME and USMLE exams.